Hello, and welcome to NDM English, and I am Nate. This time we will discuss The Dunwich Horror by H.P. Lovecraft, another in a series about some of the author's short stories. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe below to not miss any sessions. The Dunwich Horror expresses the author's opinion on the aesthetics of evil. Using the term aesthetics is meant how the shape and vision of evil can be manifest in physical form. Lovecraft was an atheist, and so his idea of evil is not bound by the traditional idea of the goodness of God against a wicked and immoral world. There is no list of deeds or wrongdoing that define morality in these stories, although some actions can bring about the destruction of civilization. For him, amoral cosmic forces are always just out of sight and ready to burst into our reality to the detriment of humanity. People who seek to help unleash these monsters of chaos and destruction are the epitome of evil among us, traitors to humanity. Only those who want to let loose the devastating cosmic forces know why they want desperately to do so, but most likely out of a strange sense of gaining power. When these evils are drawn out through bizarre and deadly rituals, the more evil they are, the more grotesque and unnatural the physical appearance. They're like Dorian Gray looking at his reflection in the mirror, becoming more ugly as they are more wicked. The longer evil is entertained or invited, the more horrifying it becomes until it contributes to complete madness in those who see it uncovered. Ultimately, if the horror is not kept back, it will destroy all that is currently alive. Then, the old ones, as they are called, will once more rule the planet as they did long before life as we know it ever existed. Beauty can exist alongside evil, sometimes hiding the terrible deeds and secrets among the pleasantries. Over time, when the worst seems to be part of the past, beauty can grow over the evil and hide its presence. It can never get rid of evil, but there will always be some remnant either just out of reach or within the memories of those who witnessed and participated. The township of Dunwich should, for a visitor, be an idyllic place to visit and admire. The landscape is described as luxurious with natural plants trees uncommonly large, and wonderful mountains and hills. Despite all these splendid descriptions, there is an uncomfortable atmosphere keeping people away. There are no artists flocking to paint its scenery, and no traveler comes to relax and enjoy the surrounding nature. In the book series The Lord of the Rings, there are similar descriptions of the Shire, where friendly hobbits live inside earth homes built in the side of hills. Outside the small shire is evil ready to enter at any time and destroy the peace and tranquility of the land. Dunwich may be nice, but it is the complete opposite of tranquil. Hardly any farmland is noticed to be productive. The homes are shabby and run down, and the people who live there are themselves in the worst conditions. They are considered unattractive and not very intelligent. Among the hills and lush vegetation, are the remains of stone structures used for dark rituals that now taint the land and curse those who live there. Where those stone structures came from, nobody really knows, but they do seem to have some ancient origin. The dark evil that wandered Dunwich using the stones and brought the near destruction of the human race was a mimicry of what many would consider holy. Among the township was a man with the last name Waitley, who was known for his witchcraft and considered a wizard. His belongings consisted of ancient books of sorcery and incantations with mysterious purposes. They were searched and treated much the same way a Bible would be to religious Christians. A local Dunwich preacher warned about the wickedness and evil growing in the area, but soon disappeared from the known records. In his place were those who used stone structures of unknown origin as pulpits to pray to powerful forces in other regions of space and time. None are as determined as Mr. Waitley to conjure these cosmic terrors with the help of his daughter. Lavinia is a young woman who wanders the woods and seems to be free of restraints, much like Pearl in The Scarlet Letter. But Lavinia isn't so innocent. Her father has taught her the ways of his worship and she has accepted them as part of her life. She is described as a white albino and white normally should have been perceived as the outward symbol of purity. But like other cultures, albino can be considered a sign of witchcraft. To complete her blasphemy, she even conceives a child, presumably as a virgin, with an eternal being. But she is no Virgin Mary, who is the mother to the child of God. The albino features contributed to her overall ugliness in both body and soul. Having given birth not to a savior, 
but an abomination that is to be used for destruction. The son of Lavinia, named Wilbur, and grandson to the wizard Waitley, is an unnatural child who grows physically and intellectually in unusual ways. After a few years of age, he quickly learns how to speak, although what he says and how he says it are not like those who live in Dunwich. The wisdom in his words are dark and clearly come from his grandfather's teachings out of the ancient forbidden books. His physical transformation is no less astonishing, as he is able to grow a beard before the time that he reaches his teenage years. Early starts in intelligence and easy development into adulthood would be desired by any other parents. The Wilbur's suddenness of strength and twisted intelligence are signs of his evil origins. Within the family, he was considered more than a boy worthy of pride, but the means of fulfilling a dark prophecy it would lead to the end of the world as presently known. Wilbur not only realizes this, but he is obsessed, along with his mother and grandfather, to bring the apocalypse. He wants to reach out and bring the old ones back so that he can become one with them and transform into his true evil self. Wilbur is not what he seems, even with the ugly angular face that disturbs those who sees him in person. His obsession with finding the book containing the correct incantations to fulfill the dreadful prophecy ends up revealing his full self. One evening, failing to steal the book he desires to use, he is attacked by guard dogs and is mortally wounded. Scratching and clawing at his clothes, the dogs uncover Wilbur's full physical form and those who see it are astonished. They can hardly believe what they are seeing, for it cannot be human. The description is of tentacled, eyes on his thighs, hairy legs like a goat, a tail with a mouth-like structure at the end, and more gruesome features. He is much more monster than man. The otherworldly nature of his creation is emphasized when he dies and melts away like thick butter. There is no mixing of the natural with the abnormal of wickedness. The human part will always be corrupt and drastically deformed. It could be nothing more than ugly and disgusting with a vague normalcy in some ways. In Wilbur's case, clothing will just barely be useful as a tool for hiding his real hideousness. Where there is evil, greater evil will not be far behind. Lavinia, the grandfather who recently died, and the soon after dead Wilbur, sought to bring something into the world of unimaginable power. They didn't succeed in their plans, but that doesn't mean danger had been thwarted. Another and more powerful creature than Wilbur has become free to roam the land and destroy whatever gets in its way. A twin was born to Lavinia, who is less human than Wilbur's slight resemblance to a man. What they get out of this monstrosity is never really explained other than to perhaps gain some of the cosmic power for themselves. Lavinia and her father could not expect to live when the horror arrives, but perhaps that survival wasn't their goal. They must have hated people and wanted to see the world taken over even at the cost of their own lives. Wilbur was the only one who, apparently, would have gotten anything out of this summoning of the vast terror from beyond. He expected to be fully transformed from the cruel, material, deformed abomination to a being of eternal spheres because of his relationship to one of its occupants. Left unchallenged, evil will spread and grow beyond the ability to defeat it because of how strong it becomes. No matter how unearthly the evil is, there is always someone to assist it in its growth and development. The Wadleys and their abomination of a son helped feed the monster that had burst through its confinement at the home. They never seemed concerned for their own safety, but continued to feed it cows that they had bought. Neighbors wondered how they kept buying cattle, but the herds never grew in size. The neighbors never investigated what might be going on at the home, while they knew it couldn't be anything good for the community. Who knows how much they even contributed to the grim situation to earn money by selling their cows. Many strange occurrences at the Waitleys should have made them want to investigate, but they probably didn't want to get involved with a family most certainly they feared. But they should have feared what they were doing more than the family, although what the family is known to be capable of is reason enough to stay away. But the monster continued to grow, first larger than the upstairs room, then the basement that they put it in, and finally taking over the whole home. Once it outgrew the home, it burst completely out and became more than Waitley's problem. Troubles start in the home and spread out to influence the whole of a community. As time goes on, there's a greater chance 
the troubles continue outside of that community and spread all over towns, until eventually taking over the whole of the world. In some ways, it is a sick representation of a meme that gets out of hand and can no longer be controlled. Remember that a meme is an idea that spreads from one source and reaches out to others until it becomes a cultural phenomena. Unlike the relatively harmless memes of jokes and social media, the monster coming from the wizard house knocks down forests and completely destroys homes, killing those who get in its way or are eaten because of its hunger. Before a person can face evil, they must become familiar with the tools used by the wicked. The librarian researcher, Mr. Armitage, is first troubled by what passages he notices Wilbur is reading from the ancient Book of Spells. This is the very same book, belonging to the library, that Wilbur tried to steal. The passage talks about eternal entities, such as Yog sagoth the grandfather of Cthulhu. That will come up in my next discussion. Yogg-Sagoth once lived on Earth and will come out of its threshold and rule Earth again. In other words, wipe out whatever is living on Earth at the moment, and then take over. Realizing that a monster is already loose that could be a devastation without any help from the old ones needing to be nearby, Mr. Armitage must use that very same book to learn how to defeat it. He must also know where it is in order to properly do the rituals necessary to banish it before it's too late. Finding the correct information in some kind of magical powder that will reveal its presence and physical form, he sets out on his dangerous quest. He doesn't want to use any of this wizardry, but there really isn't any choice. Fighting evil means encountering it, and with the ever-present danger of being consumed by its hunger. It is ever watchful for those who are hunting it in order to thwart their protective missions. As the philosopher Nietzsche has written, if you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. The Dunwich Horror is found to have more than enough of chances to look back at its pursuers. Once the magic powder is applied, the monster is revealed to be a mixture of hands, mouths, eyes, and a half-formed face covered by rope-like structures with a jelly consistency. There is no logic to its form, but again, that was a physical approximation of the horrible wickedness and evil it represents. For those who followed after it trying to kill it, they were always a few feet from the huge monster turning around and easily getting rid of them. Those who saw it from a distance might not have been in danger of death by its attacking, but they are still traumatized with the sight. One man described it in shocked desperation and ended up fainting. Although it seemed no one came out of the experience losing their minds, as is typical of Lovecraft, they would forever be tainted by its evil. The township of Dunwich never recovered if it ever was more than a degenerate land cursed by an ancient evil worship. Evil to this degree doesn't belong to the world, even if it is to be found everywhere. What is scariest of all is not knowing what motivates pure evil, or if it can actually be defended against long term. The Dunwich Horror is partly in this world but mostly belongs beyond the boundaries of what we can think of as part of our plane of existence. They are our worst nightmares come true in forms our minds can only comprehend by creating a phasmagoria of appendages and sensory organs. Unlike other stories of H.P. Lovecraft, what is missing here is a person going completely insane by this vision of doom and theorizing if this happened physically or of the mind. There were too many witnesses and actual death and destruction to question its actuality. Mr. Armitage is mostly speculating when he explains where this monster came from. Most of what he knows he gets reading the diary notes of Wilbur and the forbidden books from the library. He probably didn't think of researching this kind of material before because it was so out of the ordinary and outside of acceptable knowledge. Fearing the worst, having experienced what could have been the end of the world, he has Wilbur's notes destroyed. It probably won't do any good eventually, because, assuming the passage Wilbur reads is correct, there are similar creations of wickedness all over the earth, in secret and distant locations. This leads into the before-mentioned Cthulhu myth that this story is a part of. In another discussion, I will look at what that myth is by examining three H.P. Lovecraft short stories that are more in-depth. Make sure to click the subscribe button and notification bell so you don't miss it or other English commentary. I hope to see you again.
click the subscribe button and notification bell to not miss the next installments and analysis.